up on Makosi Today. I have 17 years experience in the tobacco industry. My personal vision is to be financially free. I'm not going to put a cap and say I want a million bucks or on a billion. I just want to be free. My lowest moments was losing my parents when I lost my dad and I lost my mom the year after. Those were the lowest moments of my life. So I vented my grief in fighting. Today I'm at the Boca Tobacco Auction Floors. You would think all I talked about today was tobacco, but Ruda talks to me about dynasty, she talks to me about culture, she talks to me about her family legacy. If I were you, I wouldn't go away and listen to this amazing story about the Boca family. In the 1980s, at a time when many African countries were celebrating their independence and enjoying their newfound freedom, Roger Boka, a tenacious merchant from Zimbabwe, had big dreams to shake the world. He was busy building an empire for his family. His ideas included venturing into an industry that wasn't very welcoming to new players, especially if they were black, selling tobacco. He was determined to create a multi-million dollar empire that would continue to grow after he was gone. But to do so, he would also have to come up with a solid plan to manage his vast wealth. By the 90s, Zimbabwe was a prime producer of the Golden Leaf. Roger Boka acquired an enormous fortune and influence in the tobacco industry, building the biggest auction floor the world had ever seen. But he had one challenge. He had seven children. How would he ensure his family would not destroy the empire? He had fought tooth and nail to build. Roger, your father, yes. was a legendary businessman. What was it like growing up with him? We read him in the newspapers and stuff, but you being in the house, being his first daughter, <laughs> what was it like? Um, it was very intense. Um, both extremes. It was, when it was love, it was very intense love. When it was a fight, it was a very intense fight. Would he whip you a little? Yes, he would. <laughs> so how did you decide, I want to do what daddy is doing? I didn't. I, I didn't decide it. Um, I, I refer to the issue of intense. I think most father-daughter relationships are that way. Right. I think fathers and daughters are fortunate to share a bond where we're the only two people in the world that will ever tell each other the truth as it is. And, and being girls, you will either marry a man who depicts or reminds you of your father, or you will marry the complete opposite. If, if at any particular point in time you want nothing to do with your dad, you will marry the opposite of what your dad is. And, but when you marry, ideally the father, a, a, a child will ordinarily look for a husband who reminds her of what the father was. So when, when you say, uh, did I choose this? No, I, I didn't. Um, I was always headstrong. I have 17 years experience in the tobacco industry. I started as my dad was building this facility. Um, and he built this in 1996. He was a merchant from 1987. He was the first indigenous man to enter into the tobacco industry. The old man had been a very successful businessman from prior independence right at the onset of, of, of independence. I say he did very well because he really did do well. But his business was focused on issues like stationery, uh, furniture, you know, the, the easier businesses to do. It was considered that's the sort of business that black people can do. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And in those days, it was very normal. But, ah, okay. This black person has got a butchery, this one has got a, a bus company, this one is a shoemaker. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. there, there are certain lines of business which were identified with a certain class or even race, right. you know, mm -hmm. um, in those days. Of course. And he did so well to the extent that he managed to buy the second of his buildings that he bought in 1985. It was a building in town which he named Boca House. It was next to a building called Pollock House, which was owned by a gentleman by the name of Mr. Alvin Pollock. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Pollock is a prominent tobacco merchant that had started in those days. And uh, I don't have permission to talk about, you know, of him, but I speak of him very passionately because he's really the man that was responsible for my dad taking this decision. Right. 
They were, every day they'd meet as neighbors, fellow neighbors, hello neighbor, how was your day? Oh, business was good, it was fantastic. And amongst men, the one said, oh, today I really did do well. And then the other one says, ha, huh, you think you made money, you call that money. That's not money. He says, what do you mean that's not money? He says, I made money. Oh, really? How? Tobacco. Okay, how do I get in? He says, uh-uh. It's a white boy's playground and you can't get in because you're black. Simple. This wasn't the other one putting a restriction. He was just telling him how it is. That, Thanks. you know what, this is what I'm into. And there are no black people in this. That is the day that he said, I will be the first black one. And I won't just be a black one in it. I will do it well. I will leave my mark. I will no longer be uh, limited to the fact that black people can only do businesses like photography and book sales and this. I will make money. And that's when he decided to do the tobacco venture. So he started out as a merchant and that was the beginning of his journey in tobacco. So people saw the flaws in 1997. His journey had begun 10 years before. So it was 10 years you know, in, in the industry where he'd go to banks and say, I, I need money, can I borrow money? I'd like to buy tobacco and export it, and, you know, make my profit. And they'd say, you're black, you have no money, you have no collateral, you have no this. So those were the hurdles that he would encounter. Mm -hmm. In the midst of that, he said, you know what, whilst this dream is there, I must still do other things which will allow me to raise the capital which I cannot access from these banks that are by white people and are for white people. And, and, and you know, here, we really need, I hope people appreciate where I'm coming from when I say this, I'm not being racialistic. Of I'm course, telling yes. you exactly how it was mm -hmm. on the ground and at the time. Mm -hmm. So um, he then went into mining. Again, he was the first black entrepreneur to get into mining. Mm -hmm. And he got some mining claims, he set up his mining company, he got involved with uh, some Russians, had a joint venture, and he started mining gold. So uh, in 1987, he had a fantastic run and he made a ton of money, even more money. And that's the money which started bankrolling his tobacco operations. But even then, you know, um, yes, the gold side is coming along, he's mining it, he's also doing gold buying, he's trading it, he's trying to develop the value addition chain because it's not enough to have access to the raw material. The issue is being able to add value, getting the final value from the final finished product. This, this has been the issue, mm -hmm. and my dad appreciated this. So come around about 1989, 1990, um, he's in the industry of tobacco, and he's being stifled. Every turn he's being stifled, and he suddenly realized it had to do with the law, the act. Mm -hmm. The act of tobacco restricted newcomers so to speak, you know, because it's, it's, it's like a family, I mean, in the world, you, you get people in oil, you know, you, you kind of have to fit in right. from the beginning, I mean, he was the odd apple. Yeah. So he lobbied the government to change the existing law that governed the tobacco industry to allow black participation. In that lobby, he was then appointed to the Tobacco Marketing Board. It was called the Tobacco Marketing Board then. Mm -hmm. Now it's called the Tobacco Industry and Marketing Board. And he served as a board member during that time. Um, I think if anyone goes to the history of the TMB at that time, I think people will see there was some sort of a revolution which went, which went on because there were changes in the legislation which then allowed to put, to, to ensure that provisions would allow anyone not just a black man, but anyone who felt they wanted to get into the tobacco industry. You know, that's where it starts. Right. It starts the legislation. So, in as much as I'm, I'm digressing to, to, it's not politics, but I'm, I'm digressing as an ordinary Zimbabwean. I really appreciate the constitution making process mm -hmm. because that's 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 where it all begins. Exactly. From the constitution comes the laws that are in place, and it's the laws that allow the people to be empowered, and it's those of us that choose to read, to understand, and and carry on in accordance with what with what the laws of our country say. So do you have any low moments? Like, when yes. I met you today, I saw this very strong woman, okay. and today I had a low moment, mm -hmm. I cried. But yes. when you look at me, you know I can easily just break down. But when I look at you, I don't see that. So do you have any low oh, moments? Of course, absolutely. How uh, do you deal with them? I cry. 
<laughs> you cry? Absolutely. Why is like I, I, I cry, I throw my toys out of the cot. If I need a tantrum, I will go to town. Okay, I feel so I, much better about <laughs> myself. Yeah, but so, um, I think you, you asked what the low moments are. Mm -hmm. My lowest moments was losing my parents when I lost my dad and I lost my mom the year after. Yes, sir. Uh, those were the lowest moments of my life. How did you go through that as a family? As a family, um, okay, I think grief is, you know, has to be measured on an individual basis. Right. Although the healing process has to be collective. Um, yes, I think you heal better as a unit than to try and pull it off yourself. Um, with dad, yes, he was ill, we knew, and he'd talk to us. So you, you know when, when someone always tells you, I'm not well, I could go at any time and make sure you do this, make sure you remember this and so forth. When it comes, you sort of like, yes, but why? He could have, you, you know, there's always a why, there's always a denial. It's normal in, in, in the grieving process. Um, and yes, generally the family, yes, so we were together during that process. And the grieving process for dad, for me, had to do with the state of the companies because there was an onslaught on the survival of the companies where my dad died. His bank had collapsed. And I believe that there were certain issues which were handled very irregularly. And I mean, I just felt that, no, 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 that's not right. So I vented my grief in fighting. So I think a lot of people say, oh, she's very strong. She fought for her companies. It was actually grief. And that's how I let it out for me. That, that's how I got into the business. So it goes back to your question. When did you decide? I didn't decide. It right. was something which came. Right. It, it just came. And I think, yes, the grieving process just led me on a different path. And, and all my siblings were in school. I, I was the eldest. With my mom, that was very unexpected. Um, you know, she went in for a very basic uh, procedure, surgical procedure. She never woke up from the operating table. That really made me mad because she wasn't ill. And, you know, she was supposed to be out after a day or two. And um, I was supposed to send her on holiday. And, you know, the week before she was telling me about how she wanted to start a mushroom project. and. I was furious. I was, I couldn't believe it. I was like, I'd lost dad the year before. Now it was mum. And I'm like, what have I done? You, you know, you kind of, you take it very personally. And it's a test of your relationship with God. You, 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 you really then say, but dear God, why? You, you know, but with time and I think where I am at the moment, I understand and appreciate now that God never gives you anything he knows you're not capable of dealing with. If it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. And whenever something bad happens to you, whenever you're going through something difficult, it's imperative that you really go through it because it's a preparation for a blessing. It's, it's a positioning for a responsibility going forward. So I think I'm at a stage now where when I go through something, I don't say why. I'm like, bring it on. Right. Because there's going to be something fantastic up ahead. I'm going to get there. <laughs> <laughs> so if the United Nations today decided no tobacco, they banned tobacco worldwide, yes. what next? I, the issue of, of the tobacco ban, I think I, you've got to try and look at it as objectively as, as, as possible. And I believe that the initiative has come across from a perspective to do with health issues. Cancer, it's a known fact, right, that there are risks involved with smoking, etc., etc. So the ban is coming from that context to say, you know what, if we can take away the things that can exacerbate and cause harm to people, that's the context in which it's coming from. When you look at the, 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 how the ban is being spoken of, how the lobby is proceeding and how they're intending to sort of really be more aggressive about it, it's coming from the treaty, which is FCTC, that's the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Um, interestingly, in that treaty, they mention that whilst the ban should be implemented or as it's implemented, there must be alternatives for those that grow tobacco. Now this is the practical reality. Right. What is the reality, the practical reality, of those countries that depend on tobacco production? 
what is their ability to switch to alternative crops? Do the climates allow so? Uh, we, do you know what I mean? Because the, the, the tobacco, tobacco grows in like our oil, right? Yes, yes. One can easily equate, equate it. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's, that's an appropriate example. Mm. So that's like saying um, Nigeria stop producing oil or any other. Exactly. So we're saying, okay, fine, if you want us to stop producing tobacco, what do you expect us to produce and how? Is it possible? Is it practical? So there are provisions, or rather there's, there are discussions within the treaty on addressing this. So, so whilst this, you know, my apologies, it's, you, you know, you kind of go in circles. Mm -hmm. So whilst that debate is going on, right, the issue now is that up until the time that alternatives have been identified, focus is now do less harm. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. So then now you find we in Zimbabwe are talking about issues of traceability. We're talking about issues of compliance. That tobacco must be grown in a manner that does not compromise the integrity of the raw material which goes into the final product that they are seeking to ban. Right. right. There's the issue of banning non-compliant chemicals because these are the things that make the cigarette bad. Right. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So if a certain chemical is applied, it, 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 it has a, a component, it has a, a, there's a role that it may play, right? So this is where we are now in Zimbabwe. To say, you know, whilst that debate is going on, we are carrying on because we advocate for choice. Right. This is informed choice. Mm -hmm. We don't say sell cigarettes to children. No. This is for adults. It's for adults to make an informed decision. Adults that choose to smoke. Adults that choose to smoke. Why do we not see the same ban coming out for alcohol, sugar, everything in moderation? Can I ask you something, Tatero? Do you smoke? No, I don't. Why? I, I never It's not a choice. It's number one, it's not a choice. Mm -hmm. um, but in my industry, there will be situations where we may get visitors or merchants that will say, oh, if we're trying out a blend, try this. Because it's my industry. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've tried a whiff of this, but it hasn't done anything for me. So you haven't gotten hooked? No. So what's your vision yeah. for the future of the Boca Company? Mm -hmm. What is your vision? The vision of Boca Tobacco Floors is to be the service provider of choice to the tobacco industry. We're a service provider. Mm -hmm. Why? Because that's the spirit in which this facility was designed and built to serve the growers, to serve the merchants, to serve our country. Mm -hmm. That's what this place was for. My dad believed in empowerment, he believed in people's prosperity. And this is a place where people can achieve that. I hope you'll have the time to go around and see some of the farmers downstairs and you'll see what we're doing, the service provision. Yes, fine, we're a facilitator, we bring the farmers together with the merchants, but we pay these guys in two hours. Mm -hmm. There are people here that are walking away with 10 grand in their pockets. No other industry in Zimbabwe is paying people within such a period of time. My personal vision is to be financially free. I'm not going to put a cap and say I want a million bucks or a billion. I just want to be free. Financial. If I want to go and visit a friend in a strange part of the world, I should be able to jump in a plane, my own plane, and do so. He without any that. restrictions. <laughs> and I believe every woman should also think along those lines, any line which will give them freedom. Freedom to be an entrepreneur, to be a wife even, because you know what, in as much as we'll say yes, the D comes home, you know what, it's a, it's a, it's a fantastic union, an even more fantastic union, when the other can inspire the other. Right. When the other can help the other, when the other can be the shoulder to, it's, it's both ways. Ladies, let's put away these perceptions that this terrain or this territory is, it's not there, it's in our heads. Right. We may have grown up being taught or told these things, but it's not true. It's not true. If God felt that there was a reason why men are born from women, 
we are good for it. Tearjerking, empowering, educating, Rudo Boka, the CEO of Oka Tobacco Auction Floors, is the epitome of an African woman that is just arising. I mean, she's only 37. She's someone I can look up to and someone who will definitely inspire you. Until the next episode of Makosi Today, take care of each other. Being spared in such a terrible and a fatal accident, you know that there can only be greater things waiting for you. You recently lost your brother. How has that changed your vision for football, for yourself and for Zimbabwe? 